next year, uh, we were, are going to broaden our focus. We will always focus on the continent of Africa, but you will see additional areas that we will take up. Uh, I want to thank all of the members of the diplomatic corps who are here, and I also want to thank all of the panelists who are joining us today. Uh, as you know, the topic of this breakfast is understanding the Sahel with a focus on politics, security, and development. And while we were already in the planning uh, area to focus on this topic, recent events in this year further emphasized the need for a broader policy discussion on our security focus uh, in Africa. And let me say that uh, the deaths of the four soldiers, uh, we were already undertaking an examination of the U.S. military involvement on the continent of Africa, and we're working closely with our Republican colleague, Adam Kinzinger, to do a congressional delegation looking at U.S. military involvement on the continent of Africa in the first half of next year. And um, when the deaths of the four soldiers uh, occurred, that certainly heightened uh, our need, desire, and interest now in the entire uh, Congress to look at U.S. military involvement. And while also while we were planning, there were other major events happening on the continent of Africa, as there always are, whether we are talking about the elections in Kenya, in Liberia, the recent very dramatic events in Zimbabwe, the ongoing near famine conditions in South Sudan, Nigeria, and Somalia, and now whatever is going on in Libya yes. regarding the slave trade is just an abomination. And I will tell you that uh, we are preparing now to introduce a resolution. We're just getting co-sponsors from um, uh, Congress, from the House, to sign on to a resolution condemning what we are seeing in Libya, but also calling on the international community to act. And uh, stay tuned, because I think you will see an action from the Congressional Black Caucus uh, within a matter of days uh, regarding the situation. So having said that, we know that the Sahel region has faced a range of interconnected challenges, including extreme poverty, food insecurity, demographic explosion, a youth bulge that the entire continent faces, high unemployment, and weak institutions. These socioeconomic challenges have been exploited by criminal and terrorist groups. One of our concerns about U.S. military involvement uh, on the continent is that we want to make sure that the United States stays focused on addressing the root causes. We also want to make sure that at least this administration focuses, I can't say stay focused, I can say focuses on the continent of Africa. And, uh, and, and all of us can laugh, uh, but all of us know that we're deeply concerned about this administration and uh, what is happening, whether we are talking about the State Department or trying to figure out what this administration's policy is going to be regarding the continent of Africa. The Sahel is also one of the world's climate change hotspots, and it has experienced more frequent droughts and floods that threaten the livelihoods of populations which overwhelmingly rely on agriculture for survival. People across the Sahel have been greatly impacted by the social, political, and economic and environmental situations, and the precarious situation has led to the region becoming a key source of and transport, transit point for migrants from sub-Saharan Africa seeking a better life in Europe. Our panelists will discuss regional initiatives such as the G5 Sahel, regional politics, and the challenging equilibrium between security assistance and development in the Sahel. I now want to turn it over to Vivian Derrick, who will introduce and moderate the discussion. She is a veteran foreign affairs specialist and has had a long career in international development. Ms. Derrick is currently the president and CEO of the Bridges Institute, a nonprofit she founded to help strengthen African governance and leadership after serving as an inaugural fellow at the Advanced Leadership Institute initiative at Harvard University. Ms. Derrick spent several years at USAID where she served as the Assistant Administrator for Africa. She also worked at the Academy for Educational Development for 10 years in a variety of roles. So our format, as always, we will hear from the panelists and then we will open it up with plenty of time for a Q&A. And you know if you have attended these policy breakfasts before, we don't force people to ask questions, um, but we don't want keynote speeches either. So we will take in rapid succession a number of comments or questions, 
and then allow the panelists to uh, respond. So once again, thank you all for taking the time out this morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. To, to really um, thank Congress member Bass for her sustained commitment to to Africa and raising these issues and making sure that we keep that focus. So can we please applaud her and her good So Rep. Bass mentioned several um, events that are occurring right now as, as we speak. And I, I was going to do exactly the same thing so I don't have to repeat it. But just to emphasize, first is the, the easier killings. And we haven't talked about the fact that ISIS now has been um, uh, reduced or some say destroyed. But what that means is that you're going to see ISIS kinds of activities popping up every place else. And one of the examples of that was Egypt and the bombing um, of, the, of the mosque. Um, we also see that in Mali. Remember now that Mali is the, is the most dangerous um, peacekeeping force in the world. And just this past week, four Malian soldiers, four, four peacekeepers and one Malian soldier were um, killed. And then lastly, um, I don't know if you saw it or not, but 41 Muslim countries met in Riyadh and they're establishing the Islamic Military Counterterrorism Coalition. So this is, um, I think, something that we need to be paying careful attention to because it's led by Saudi Arabia, but apparently it's going to involve every single um, Muslim country um, in, in the world. So we have three experts here to help us think through the challenges and to come up with some really concrete ideas about what we can do next. Um, first is um, Excellency Honorable Seiju Kabore, who is the ambassador um, of Burkina Faso to the United States. He has more than 30 years of professional experience in the private and public sectors. Um, he's been very much involved in banking, risk management, business management, human resources. When you read his profile, you see that this is a person who is a, a very accomplished professional. His current focus as ambassador is to forge um, trade connections to strengthen business development as well as capacity building in the in Faso. He's been here since December um, of 2016, so, so this is your one year anniversary. So we're very happy that you're on this panel. Thank you. Um, Kamisa Kamara is, a, Kamara is a fellow with the Center for African Studies at Harvard University and with Foreign Policy Interrupted. She's also the very new Sub-Saharan Africa Director at Partners Global. Prior to joining Partners Global, um, Kamisa was the um, Senior Program Officer for West Africa and Central Africa at the NED, the National Endowment for Democracy. She managed electoral assistance programs in Sub-Saharan Africa and the Caribbean, um, before that with, with IFAS International Foundation for Electoral Assistance. She's also the co-founder and co-chair of the Sahel Strategy Forum, which is a partnership with Bridges for full disclosure. It's an integrated policy forum that provides a platform to um, donors, program implementers, implementers, academics, and civil society, and the private sector. And what it does is try to promote democratic um, values. So Kamisa is also very well um, published political commentator, and I'm sure you've heard her on on CNN or um, other American and French um, programs on TV and radio. So we have uh, two, so far, two um, excellent um, persons to talk about this. And the third is no less stellar, Linda Etim, who is the former USA Assistant Administrator for Africa. Long to, I mean, a lot of time in between and a lot of changes for the continent. Um, but she's responsible for more than $7 billion of assistance to um, funding for 46 countries and 29 regional or bilateral missions across Sub-Saharan Africa when she was um, in office. Before she was the uh, AA, she was the 
Deputy Assistant Administrator. And there she um, looked at how the U.S. focuses on stabilizing fragile states. So you know that this is, makes her um, extremely important for this. Before that, she served on the National Security Council as Director for East African Affairs, and she was responsible for coordinating U.S. policy on the continent, some of the continent's most important um, challenges. And she spent a, a decade for that in specializing uh, in African security affairs at the Department of Defense and Intelligence Community. So you see that you have three persons who have extraordinary competence and expertise to be able to um, guide this um, panel. So I'm going to start with um, Kanisa. I'm going to ask each of them a question. They'll respond and talk to maybe five to seven minutes. And then um, we'll have maybe one exchange among the people. <coughs> Excuse me, and then we'll do questions. <coughs> so, um, when we think about the Sahel now, we're looking at basically the five countries of the, of the, um, the um, G5, but we're also looking at Senegal and Nigeria, because we've certainly got to talk about um, Boko Haram, and so it's a little bit of an expanded definition. Of the of the Sahel, so remember that um, with Mali we had this uneasy peace, um, and um, now we have the um, the UN peacekeeping mission Burkina Faso. We had um, a bit of a challenge, but then a very good transition. Nigeria we've got Boko Haram, um, Niger we had the deaths of the three of the rays. Um, so when you think about this broader context, you're thinking about a region that really is in some um, turmoil. And it has multiple stakeholders, so that's what we're going to be thinking about as we listen to our um, panelists. So there are the governments, there are the Islamic um, militants, there are the um, more than 11,000 UN peacekeepers in Mali. We've got the um, five Sahel nations that we talked about as, as a um, group plus the, the other two. Then you've got to think about citizens and civil society. What are people, regular citizens, thinking about um, in this? And then the international partners, including the U.S. and the P3, the African Union, um, ECOWAS. So this is a rich stew. So we're going to turn first to Kamisa to help us try to sort this um, out. Kamisa security is the first order of business in any country. Right, found foundational. So the U.S. has um, dedicated sixty million dollars now to the um, G5 countries to um, help them. Because apparently, Secretary Tillerson said, "Asked what can we do that's most helpful," and the countries answered um, to please give us some um, support. So, um, is that a wise strategy on the part of the U.S. And what are your thoughts about how these funds could be best used? All right, thank you, Vivian, and, and good morning, everyone. Um, so the U.S. pledge to fund uh, Sahel countries is in reaction to a side event that occurred last month and which hit uh, close to home. Uh, the death of four uh, U.S. Greenberries in, in Niger really triggered questions about the U.S. role in, in the Sahel, about uh, the, the role of the U.S. in tackling extremism uh, in the region. And some U.S. policymakers were even surprised that the U.S. was involved uh, in the Sahel region, even though this has been the case for many, many, many years. Um, so again, the, 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 the fact that the U.S. is pledging uh, $60 million is in reaction to, to the Niger event. Now, is, um, is, is this pledge part of a strategy uh, or even a wise strategy? I'm not so sure. Uh, the, the G5 Sahel countries uh, uh, until the, the Niger, uh, Mali, Burkina Faso, Mauritania, and Chad, uh, five French-speaking uh, countries. And they do need this money to be able to secure their borders and, and to be able to, to fund uh, their soldiers and equip them to, to patrol uh, borders in the region. And um, they recently uh, said that what they needed, so the first year operational budget is $500 million. So the $60 million that the U.S. is pledging uh, for the G5 force 
is uh, about 12% of the first year's uh, budget of the G5 Sahel. So this is a wonderful um, uh, move on the part of the U.S. However, if we want uh, those $60 million to be effective, and I think this is the underlying question that I'm being asked here, we have to make sure that we simultaneously continue to fund uh, critical U.S.-led initiatives, including the ECODA program, which is um, uh, designed to help African militaries uh, build their, their capacity uh, through trainings and equipment uh, to peace operations, uh, and also the Security Governance Initiative, which was launched by President Obama uh, back in 2014, and which addresses the nexus between uh, governance and security. So those two uh, initiatives, and, and there are more, but those two main initiatives need to be funded uh, uh, at the same time as we are committing the $60 million uh, to uh, the Sahel countries. One other point that I would like to add is that the U.S. is not going to fund uh, the G5 Sahel as an entity. Um, the U.S. wants to, find, uh, to fund uh, those countries bilaterally, meaning it is going to fund them individually, um, which uh, will potentially help to shore up the, the G5 and combat terrorism, but this is the approach that the U.S. is, is taking. Uh, again, uh, so for, for the U.S. to be uh, effective in the region, uh, we have to make sure that this is uh, part of a strategy that continues to fund uh, U.S.-led initiatives, but also um, that uh, tackles uh, the issues of sustainability and predictability, and I'm not sure that we're there yet. Thank you, Kim. Um, so I'm now going to turn to Linda. Um, because Linda, you said three things, development, security, um, and the politics. You're a development specialist. And we know that the root causes of jihadism, <coughs> excuse me, we know that the root causes of jihadism and, and the uh, problems that we've seen are poverty, food insecurity. Brett Bass just talked about the fact of climate change. Um, and minimal and often corrupt governments. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, and we also see that we've had a, this fairly dramatic decrease in foreign assistance. So, what would be the best use of these reduced foreign assistance dollars? And also, could you also assess the role of civil society and women's groups and our emphasis on resilience? And good morning, everybody, as well. And I wanted to say thank you to Congresswoman Bass. Um, we, it's a very difficult set of questions to answer uh, in five minutes. I think that's what I'm supposed to do. So uh, feel free later on to, to, to really dig into this, because I, I think that the most important point in your question is, at a time when US government assistance is falling, we are acknowledging the complexity of the issues this region is facing. We have more and more U.S. troops uh, on the ground putting their lives at risk, and yet we're drawing back funds from uh, actually addressing and confronting and helping communities uh, to solve and deal with the very root causes uh, of those security challenges. Um, so, it, you know, it's, 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 it's important to say that I'll talk a little bit about where we might be able to target uh, some of those limited funds, but I think the bottom line that I have to start with is, as a global community, we're not putting enough money into the Sahel region uh, for economic development and governance uh, purposes to get ahead of the challenges that the region is facing. We're not doing so. And until we do so, all of these questions of security and stability and the youth vote, agriculture and uh, climate change desertification, they can't be addressed effectively. You have governments and communities on the ground who are trying to affect change, and they're doing it with unreliable funding and drips and drabs of uh, different initiatives. Um, so I, I think just to start off to say, we, we know that this is a comprehensive set of challenges and we're not, as a global community, actually investing in the ways that we need to. Uh, and that would be a great starting point, but now I'll go back to reality of where our funding is. Um, so uh, when you look at uh, some of the, 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 the issues uh, that are most pressing right now, uh, the idea that you've got about a million children uh, every year in this region 
that are dying from malnutrition is something that we, we don't often see. We don't treat it like a crisis in some ways anymore uh, because people have become habituated to it. Um, and the idea that you've got so much pressure on this young population because it's one of the youngest regions in the world um, and you've got this idea of a population, right? You've got, you know, this estimated 100 million people, which is almost doubling of the, the population within a 10 year uh, period. Um, and the estimation still is saying 200 million by 2050 uh, people in this region, uh, when you're not increasing and upping the levels of investment uh, in economic growth and money. You also have 40% of the people in the country which are dependent on agricultural livelihoods, but 80% of the land uh, in the region has already been degraded because of desertification, deforestation, overcropping, the fact that now we're dealing with floods and droughts and an increasing number. You can call it climate change, you can call it whatever you want, but we know that the reality on the ground is that governments in the region have been trying to grapple with this for a long time, but they can't as long as they have to respond to humanitarian crises that keep happening. Um, so looking at this from a youth-centered lens is probably the most effective uh, <coughs> use of resources uh, that foreign assistance could help governments uh, in the region to accomplish. We know that you can't separate it out and say only health, only agriculture, only education. It has to be a comprehensive approach and it has to be focused on this, uh, this wide uh, and very important youth bulge that's not going to happen, is currently happening. And so youth-centered approaches to looking at wide, uh, wide uh, development issues, making sure that the U.S. government continues to fund economic growth funding, um, that we are make sure that democracy and governance funding uh, stays steady. This, this is the money that you use for food security, and this is the money that you use for livelihoods and community integration and the work with uh, security, the security sector. Um, and making sure that those humanitarian assistance levels uh, stay at least where they were before, if not higher, because our humanitarian assistance has been working with people on the ground for years uh, to actually uh, move money in different ways and focus on resiliency uh, rather than just handing out food. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Linda. <laughs> Thank you, Linda, and uh, especially to the point about the unreliability of the, of the funding and the humanitarian is really clouding up traditional development uh, uh, assistance. So now we've got the, the context of both the, um, the political and, and security strategy, and you also have the move from a development perspective and the long term aspects that are needed for that. So now we're going to look at a specific country and see how these um, factors are playing out. And the country is Burkina Faso, which is um, viewed as um, a leader in terms of making the transition to strong democracy with um, um, decentralization and finding ways in which to manage this security um, governance relationship. So, um, Ambassador, um, last week in the African Ministerial that Secretary Tillerson held, um, he asked how the U.S. could be most helpful. As he said, your country um, and others said, give this um, more assistance. So, is it helpful to you to receive the assistance in this bilateral way? How will this play out in Burkina Faso? Because you certainly don't have the, the funding yet. And also, given your positive experience, um, do you have any special insights on strategies that have been particularly useful to you in Burkina Faso that you can share with us? Thank you very much. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to extend my uh, thanks to the Honorable Senators, Karen Bass and Mark uh, Bissett, uh, who graciously invited us at this important meeting. Uh, before my response to your question, I would like to uh, make a, a small description of the region of uh, science uh, to help people to have a good understanding of the situation. 
the Zulu City Show uh, concerns the five countries uh, Mauritania, Mali, Niger, uh, Chad, and Burkina Faso. And uh, the specificity of this region is that it's a really vast and underpopulated. And uh, the terrorists they gain the, the confidence of the population there because they have uh, the fact that people have the lack of administration, but the terrorists they have the, the big advantage to 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 deal with some businesses like drugs, uh, weapons, cigarettes, cattle, fuel, and etc. So in this area, the terrorists are very rich. The leaders are rich and they are envied by the population, and they are they create job for the population. So this this issue uh, should be uh, understood by by people, and uh, unfortunately the region was abandoned by the, the, the administration since the colonial time because this region is really poor in terms of natural resources, in terms of uh, other strategic assets, and because of the nomadic nature of the, the population. And what is very serious again is the since. Uh, 2011, the destabilization of Libya consolidated the terrorists and smugglers who said uh, in the, the same region with more military and financial means. So the, the terrorists, they found a, 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 a federal ground to grow the activity. And uh, unfortunately, we, we do not have, any, uh, for now, any solution. So they use the most and the radio to highlight and criticize the exoprime living condition of the poor population. So they gain legitimacy to the detriment of the government. So they are very seriously instead there. So uh, we, now we are, we, are, we are feeling the fact that uh, with the defect of terrorists in Syria and Iraq, they will attempt to conquer more space in the Sahara region. So if nothing is done, there can be a, a kind of replica of uh, this uh, territory takeover in Syria and Iraq uh, that the international community fought so hard to dismantle. So after drawing this cell uh, environment, okay, I think that to get rid of the terrorist threats in our region and to secure the region, and plan to set up a program for certain economic growth that promotes job creation. We have to think about long-term solution. So, for the for the solution, I can see that we have like three dimensions: security, security uh, dimension, the economic solution, and the improving uh, improving governance. So, for for the security. You have a kind of particular way that uh, terrorists they use to attack the population. So we have to adapt our common conventional uh, uh, defense force to this particular uh, way to, 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 to face, to resist, and to defeat them. So we need like, uh, to authorize our units. The, the military forces uh, should be used. Uh, how can I say, authorize uh, units? To go everywhere in the region because they are, they, are, they, are, they are absent. And we have to, I think that in, we have to develop also the civil, the civil and military cooperation to have more confidence to the Israeli people. I think that when the military, like they are around them, they can give help to them, uh, bring like a project, economic project, so that the, the, the population can have it them and help them with more information. In the economic level, I think that uh, it's better to, to set up <coughs> small, how can I say, industrial units uh, based on the, the raw material comparative advantages in which this part of region have uh, a lot of advantages like milk, like uh, meat, like leather. So you can product uh, some, after I say, uh, 
final outcome uh, and provide, as I can say, a job and revenue to this population so that uh, 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 they, can be, they can live. I can say, I can say it. And uh, for the, uh, the units, the surrounding or the unit, the industrial units, I think that it's better to help the small farmers who are in charge to provide the units of uh, raw material so they can help them to enhance their skill in the management uh, so that they can uh, secure, I can say, the, 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 the growth or the, the, the family, the, the family farms. And uh, uh, on the governance way, I think that's, it's a, this one is really a challenging because it will imply uh, involve uh, the, the national and the local communities, even the population too. And uh, we have to fight against, uh, how can I say, the corruption. Uh, we have to enhance the level of education of the people. We have to uh, to give, I can say, opportunity to the youth, to the, uh, the women, so that they can have activities. Because when people that don't have activity, uh, they can be, I can say, convinced that those who, as I said, they create job in the in the region. So for us. Uh, I will take the opportunity to thank the U.S. Uh, the U.S. Uh, government and the uh, uh, citizen for the grant of 60 million dollars, which represents 12 uh, percent of the budget of uh, the G5 side. But I think that the, 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 the situation is very uh, serious. So this amount is, is not really enough to, to help to cover all the expenses needed to, to set up uh, action against uh, tourists. So, okay, uh, I would like to inform you that uh, in uh, December 14, we have uh, in, uh, can I say, in uh, Brussels a meeting to try to raise a lot of capital to face the tourist attack. So, we hope that. Uh, the necessary uh, come to this uh, meeting and we try to help our region. Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador, because you reminded us about these vast unpopulated spaces and how hard it is to, to govern there and the attraction that we see sometimes in terms of the terrorists and the fact that I think we sometimes forget how rich they are because they have these illegal means of um, getting money. And also the emphasis that you, that you mentioned on um, involving the population, giving them um, a different experience and, and hope. So now we've heard from three persons. You've got, um, a, I think, a really strong context for um, our discussion. So first I'm gonna ask if any of the panelists want to address a question or a comment to each other. Uh, maybe I'll start, and that will, uh, I'm, I'm sure, trigger uh, questions uh, during the Q&A. Maybe one thing that I would like to, to highlight here is that the United States and all of those multilateral organizations and institutions that have been involved in the Sahel really need to start thinking about uh, doing things differently. I think that what has been happening is that we've been reacting to events um, through funding, uh, through media reports. Uh, there is a killing here, and here we fund uh, a, a, a strategy or uh, a military operation. Um, and I'm not sure that this is the most effective way of engaging in the region, which um, can easily uh, explode in our faces if we don't really uh, set up mechanisms to, to control uh, the main challenges of the, region, of, the, of the region. So it's not difficult, I think, to predict what is going to happen in the Sahel or what is going on in the Sahel. Uh, you're dealing with the, the weakest governments in the world. Uh, you're dealing with um, the, the poorest countries in the world, the highest birth rates, uh, the lowest literacy rates, uh, the uh, a, a 
and a, a youth bulge. All of these ingredients combined is an explosive cocktail, um, which is, I mean, it's very easy to predict what is going to happen in, in this region. And even though uh, what has been happening in Sahel is of remote importance to the U.S. or has been of remote importance to the U.S. less than 10 years ago, today the U.S. cannot say that. Um, this is really a problem, everybody's problem, and uh, we need to think about uh, how to um, set up mechanisms that will control uh, some of those issues that I just mentioned. All right, so um, thank you for giving us a bit. Thank you for giving us additional context and for emphasizing that this is a world problem that's set at the, the top. You push down ISIS in one place, it pops up someplace else, and the someplace else is um, now Africa, North Africa, and Sub Saharan um, Africa. Um, any other comments from our panelists before we go to questions? I apologize, I'll, be, I'll keep this. Quick, but I would be remiss if I did not address the role of women in the issue uh, and, and just like to address it all as well. It was one of the questions that you put to me, and because I saw my time counting down, I, I just didn't mention it. But um, I just want to say uh, a role about the role of women because women are often invisible uh, in crises. Um, but we all know that in development and in stability terms, uh, their role is essential. Um, and they are the most affected by security uh, concerns, climate shocks, uh, economic downturns, um, and that to actually come up with sustainable solutions, if you don't have inclusive processes over time, you don't actually end up solving these basic issues. And it's been uh, a, an error that we as an international community and that many uh, countries uh, in the region have made uh, over and over uh, during the years of not including the very great thinking uh, the women's organizations uh, and, and, and the insights that uh, women's groups already have, having experienced years after years of the problems with seeing their young people go out uh, and be recruited or have to go out their livelihoods or how they can prevent uh, communities from being either radicalized or uh, their need uh, to actually uh, earn a living. Uh, and so when you come back to reconciliation and how people come back into communities, the role of women uh, is also very essential. So I don't want to leave it completely off to the side, so I wanted to mention it uh, before the q Good, thank you for doing that, because if no one else had, then you know that I was going to come, come back to that, so thank you. All right, so now we're going to turn to, so Ambassador would like to make a, a comment as well. Uh, the education issue, I think that's a more important, one of the more important issue to, 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 to solve. And secondly, I think that our core solution should be addressed involved in the global and value value chain. We have to be a part of the global economy. So I think that we need to be helped in this sense. We have a lot of raw materials. Instead of uh, exporting those raw materials, I think that the, the main point is I have that to set up a small, small industry. So uh, industrial units which can help us to be a part of the global economy, create a value, create jobs. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. I, I see this long, long list of people. So we're going to take three questions at a time, no statements, identify yourself, and ask your question crisply. Got it? All right, so we're going to start right here. Thank you very much. My name is Ania. Mr. Tim, um, when I heard your background, I was um, Press that you have security, you, you've done security work as well. When the Sahel G5 ministers were here last month, one of the things they said is we need security because if we are building schools, the terrorists come and blow it up. And so we have to secure and protect our development projects. I was wondering if you agree. And Mr. Ambassador, um, could you please link um, Libya 
to the problems in the Sahel D5 because your ministers made that same statement and now uh, Libya is in the news. But can you talk about the invasion of Libya and overthrow of uh, Muammar Gaddafi and that, the impact of that on the Sahel? Thank you. I think I can save some time uh, by just saying, yes, I absolutely agree with the statement that uh, security is fundamental uh, protecting development gains. Um, but it shouldn't be the only thing that we focus on. We need to be thinking about development even as uh, insecurity persists and have a long view on uh, how to make sure uh, that we're moving countries and communities forward. So I do agree. All right, we'll go to this side, and we're going to just take some Good morning. I'm an African Middle East analyst. Uh, thanks for a great presentation from our panelists. Uh, I will uh, respectfully disagree with you that actually Africa is extremely rich. This is one point. And following up on that one, we have been talking and dealing with sustainable development in Africa for more than 55 years, and it seems that nothing has been changed. Is it time to actually stop completely this so-called development and talk about good government? Over here. Morning, ladies and gentlemen. Congress, Human Karen Park, thank you so much for this wonderful event and the last one. Uh, my question, my comment is uh, Congress, Human Karen Park, I really thank you for doing all the work for Africa since we came here. We've been coming here day and night. What I would like you to do is next first meeting to hold it at the African Union. You know, sometimes you can hold stuff out of home, but we want you to come to the African Union where we have a powerful, powerful African woman ambassador who can take all this. So okay. our question is, how do we collaborate? We've been collaborating with you, with the group speaking, because Sahel cannot do it alone. We are here, civil society. The professionals are there, think tanks are there, businesses are there. How do we come together? Everybody's doing small things or big things. They don't want to collaborate with even small organization on the ground. And this is where the problem is for Africa. If that is the day, slavery in Ethiopia or anywhere. How do we collaborate? But I think the African Union ambassador has uh, an answer. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Congresswoman Bass, for the events that shed light on uh, African affairs. I'm Andrew Iva with the Freedom for Sudan Committee, uh, uh, opposing uh, trying to get a stop to the ongoing racist genocide in Sudan. Uh, the question I have is the contradiction between two types of reports about uh, the, the terror groups in the uh, terror, uh, Sudan's role in the terrorism. One. Uh, our intelligence agencies report that uh, we support the Sudan government. We are acquiescing in them because they are so supportive in the intelligence field. That's what Senator Cory Booker said last uh, couple of months ago in an African hearing that our first American interest in Sudan is counterterrorism. On the other hand, we get a very different report from sources on the ground in the Sudanese resistance, which point out that people from there's militias from Boko Haram, from the Tuaregs, uh, ISIS itself, it undergoing training in certain camps in the Nuba area and in the uh, outskirts of Kabul. I'm not Kabul, I'm sorry, uh, Khartoum. So, uh, so I'd like to see if anyone has any insights on the sponsorship of terrorist groups from Sudan, of those terrorist groups causing problems in the Sahel now. Thank you. Turn, come back to this time. Yes, good morning. My name is Dashan Farag. I'm a reporter for BureaBlackWorld.net. I would like to know, do any of the speakers feel that Africa is a good thing or a bad thing for the continent? Thank you. Good morning. I'm Angela Walker-Smith for Bread for the World. I'm a senior associate for Pan-African Church Engagement there. My question is a question of coordination and intersectionality, particularly with the legislation that our Congress has enacted relative to Electrify Africa, to AWEB, to AGOA. 
where do these legislative um, pieces fall within the strategies around the issues that we've spoken to this morning? I also, of course, would want to talk about what is the intersectionality of advocacy with faith groups, uh, particularly in that area and also outside of that area as well. And thank you very much for your presentations. Excellent. Thank you. I think we'll take two more. Franklin Moore. Um, so I'm going to try to reduce this to a, to a quick question that's not going to be easy. And I'm going to build on what the ambassador spoke of, because the ambassador talked about the variety of illegal but financially very lucrative activities that take place in the region as a way to, for populations to make money where the resources may not be so great. And he mentioned a variety of them. One of them he mentioned was cigarettes. We in America think that's strange. One he didn't mention is illegal pasta trade that takes place between Mali and places like Algeria. What country? Pasta. Pasta. Because pasta is because pasta in in Algeria is subsidized, and it is not subsidized anywhere else in the region. So subsidize, it, it, it's, it's those sort of goods that create illegal activities. So my question is, what do you see as the legitimate activities that should be moving in to replace those illegal activities? We do know that in Niger, they have done a wonderful job in places like Tilbury of introducing onions and tomatoes commercially, and we have people from Benin who come to get them, but I'm interested in what the other things should be. Thank you. you you've given us a, a new perspective with pasta. Well, Thank you. A big product. Good morning. I want to thank uh, all of the panel members for coming, and also for Congressman Bass for continuing my question is about security, the last security on Africa. I'm confused. AFRICOM, when the uh, AFRICOM was uh, created and under the commander, um, under the directorship of General Ward, the whole concept of Africa is that, I mean, uh, AFRICOM is that they didn't want it to be stationed permanently in Africa. So there wouldn't be a U.S. permanent presence in Africa. Uh, I mean, I heard it very clear, clearly from General Ward. And that's why AFRICOM, their headquarters is in Stuttgart, Deutschland, in Germany. Now, um, what happened? Why is there so much mission slip? And the direction has been completely almost a 180 turn. I'm really confused about that. As a follow-up question, if we're talking about economic development, what happened to Chad? What happened to all the money, the oil money that the mobile had when they had the pipeline from the south of uh, Chad all the way down through Cameroon into uh, Douala the Port? Please, uh, someone in life would like Thank you. We'll take one more. more. And then, I'm sorry, you'll have to beg my apology. This is more of a statement. I just wanted to say I'm with the Africa's Foundation. I'm Lori Elliott. We are actually working on integrated uh, economic development projects in Libya, Chad, and uh, Mali. So I just wanted to say that many of the issues that you're talking about, we, we're working on a strategy. We actually have a strategy. We even have money. And so that is, um, that's, that's part of um, what I wanted to say. The other thing I wanted to say is that um, we also have Dumoti Eridedi. He's from the Tupu Nation, which spans um, South Libya, North Chad, and Niger. And if you want any information about what's actually happening on the ground, you can have him speak. He speaks French, if there's someone who can translate. Um, there's also a South Libya Peace and Development Plan that was agreed to at the beginning of this year. He was the architect. It was signed with the Libyan government. Um, Libya is not Arabic. It's, it's other nations, a lot of black Africans. So in the south in particular, there are many different tribes, the Tabu, the Tuareg, and so, um, so they're actually bringing the Deputy Prime Minister of Libya here in January and also the Prime, uh, Prime Minister of Chad in a couple weeks. So um, I didn't want to take up a lot of time, but if you want to know anything about those regions, 
he will be glad to um, provide more information if someone can translate from yeah, French to English. Thank you very much. Yes. Okay. All right, so we are now going to try to um, address some of these questions. So I'm, I'm going to um, just jog your memory and then we can um, answer any of these questions that you would like to, and then we'll try to have a second round, right? So we heard a challenge about um, that good governance and development is still an issue after 55 um, years. What are we going to um, do about it? Then we heard the um, suggestion to think more about the diaspora and use the African Union as a venue. The question was, how do we coordinate with the diaspora? There was a question on Sudan as being um, a home to terrorists. What should we be um, thinking about and actions um, uh, on Sudan? Um, AFRICOM, is it good or bad? And then secondly, is there a mission creep? Then we talked about that we've got reduced resources, but still there are a lot of resources, so we need to think about better coordination and intersectionality. And we heard about the illegal goods um, activities and trafficking, that how can they be replaced by legitimate trade? Then strategy and um, money is available from our last uh, commentator and with a particular emphasis on, um, on South Libya. So who would like to begin to address one of these um, or more of these questions? Uh, sure. Uh, I'll start with uh, some of the development questions, just because um, they seem to be in a similar thread. Um, you know, one is the issue of corruption and where did all of this money uh, in the region go? Is it, you know, the challenge, is this really a poor region or is it misuse and mismanagement of funds? And the other idea has been uh, decades uh, and development has been ongoing, and yet you still have poverty, uh, high poverty rates, uh, illiteracy rates, birth rates. Is it, should we stop talking about the international community doing delivering aid and start talking about how we improve uh, management uh, and governance and what's already happening? Um, the answer to all of those questions is yes. It's not an either or. Um, there is a more effective way that the international community uh, can provide assistance to strengthening, uh, I think, the very uh, uh, pillars of governance uh, that uh, countries in the region are, are trying to be trying to work on right now. Um, the the issue is that uh, you can't disengage from the development conversation, uh, even when you know that uh, countries maybe could better use their resources. And the reason is because it's in the U.S. government's interest to do so. Uh, we end up responding to the humanitarian and security challenges of the region, uh, whether or not we invest in the development approaches. However, we know that without uh, governance, good governance, uh, the uh, uh, inclusion of communities, uh, making sure that you have uh, women and uh, local communities effectively trusting that their government uh, is uh, working in their interests, uh, we know that if you don't have those elements in place, the sustainability of development investments is always going to be in question, and that's what I think we've seen over the past 55 years. That doesn't mean that money has been wasted, and it doesn't mean that we haven't seen substantial gains uh, in, in development indicators. It's just they were worse before. It doesn't mean uh, that we're not making improvements on the agriculture side and resilience. We, we are. It's just that the population is outstripping uh, the gains that are already being made. There needs to be an acceleration uh, of a lot of these efforts, uh, and there needs to be uh, more inclusion of local communities because we already talked about the fact that there are these large government spaces, not just a focus on the central governments. So again, as we evolve in the way we think about uh, development uh, in the international space, uh, we're seeing, I think, more effective targeted uh, approaches to that. But that doesn't mean uh, that it hasn't worked or that it's something that we shouldn't do. It just means that, yes, we also need to double down on good governance. Uh, I think the question was whether or not with the meager funds that we're putting into the region, uh, where foreign assistance could best be placed. Thank you. Mr. Ambassador, would you like to address some of these questions? Yeah, thank you. Uh, it's a question about how to replace illegal activities. Uh, 
I think that in the context, in the in the rural context, first of all, you have to secure the area. After that, you can move on with projects. I can I can say uh, sustainable projects based on the raw material comparative advantages in each region. And uh, the side region is a breeding zone. So they have a lot of advantages, I told you, like as uh, on uh, with uh, milk, meat, and lead. And the solution is to invest seriously, seriously, and to help this region to be involved in the global economy. Because the, 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 the country market or the regional market is very small, it, if you want to create a real dynamic, you have to involve them in the, in the global economy. So I think that for, for me is that. So you can, we, we already know all the, the, the I can say the raw material issue and you can work globally on it to have, uh, to have the opportunity to create jobs to create revenue for people. And uh, we have also to accompany this strategy by education. Even you are talking about the, the good governance, I think that the problem with the good governance is the lack of education of population. We have definitely have to work on this point. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. You, you talked about that before. So you're, you, and I think it's important to keep re-emphasizing that we have to invest in education, both formal and informal. So we're now going to turn to Lisa. Uh, thank you. So I don't know anything about PASPA, but um, I welcome the questions about AFRICOM. Now, is AFRICOM a good thing or a bad thing for Africa? It's a very difficult uh, question to answer, and I will not answer that question directly. What I will say is that AFRICOM was set up in 2007 alongside the Trans-Sahara Counter-Terrorism Partnership uh, that the U.S. is implementing in the Sahel-Sahara states uh, to counter uh, uh, terrorism in the region. AFRICOM was never set up uh, as a French uh, military base uh, in, in Africa. The goal has never been to uh, set boots on the ground and to be involved uh, in Africa as much as the Europeans uh, have been uh, and continue uh, to be. Um, so the main objective of the Africa is to defend U.S. interests in, in, in the region. It's, it's not to defend Africans or uh, it doesn't have a philanthropist uh, objective and this, this is uh, important to uh, keep in mind. Uh, there was also a question about uh, advocacy groups and faith groups and the involvement of, of civil society uh, organizations in the Sahel. They're very, very vibrant and I think uh, uh, it was mentioned by Linda uh, that the Youth Bulge also offers opportunities and, and uh, I, I, I'm putting faith groups alongside uh, other civil society organizations groups. With all of the issues that the, the countries of the Sahel are experiencing, uh, uh, those issues also offer opportunities for civil society organizations to really step up to the, to the, to the plate and, and work in collaboration with the government um, provide the government with um, uh, the concerns of, of local populations. Again, I, I did mention that uh, we're working with a huge uh, country, and you need the relay of, of those civil society organizations to, to uh, come to governments and, and speak to them about the concerns uh, of local communities. So uh, faith organizations, faith groups, um, other civil society organizations are very, very active uh, in the region, and they certainly need funding. Thank you, Kamisa. And I want to make sure to, to, to go back to the point that you were making, um, Franklin, about the illicit trafficking. Because um, we're learning something, and I know that it's serious about the cost. Of, but as you were speaking, Mr. Ambassador, I'm, I'm thinking you're talking about the small um, inter Sahelian markets and the need to have um, a, a greater, um, bigger market. Is that something that um, ECOWAS or the AU, or is there any regional organization that um, could take this up and be useful in making that um, connection and at the same time reducing the illicit trafficking? Let me 
the solution but we think that uh, it's, it's better I can say to to, to have the, the support of the, the, the international community to help us. And uh, please I would like maybe we have maybe ambassador of Indigenous if she can have some point of view to help us to have more support for Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. First of all, I would like to thank Honorable Helen Bass for always inviting us and also to congratulate the panelists for really pinpointing the main issues. At the beginning, I was asked when you finish if I want to say something. I say you have said it all. So I concur with most of the uh, with most of you who have some opinion, whether you are talking about security, whether you're talking about governance, whether you're talking about really development. We always say you cannot have security without development and you cannot have development without security. And this is critical I think for us to and one thing that Carissa said at the beginning, really for us so far what we are not uh, apprehending is what is the strategy, the U.S. strategy. I think maybe uh, the discussion is how can we have a very uh, holistic approach to supporting Sahelian countries. And education and education is very important. And when we say education, we are talking about formal and non-formal education. But we are talking about also training professional and vocational training to capacitate people so that they can really use their skill, not only within their setting and across. And most of the time, the issue that we are facing is deep poverty. When you have deep poverty, you are exposed to every, any problem in the environment. So how to really uh, uh, reduce poverty by promoting socioeconomic development in the region? That will very much be the need that we have uh, right now. So education to really equip the youth, but socioeconomic development to really give people an active opportunity to have activities that will ca capture them. And I wholeheartedly uh, agree with uh, my colleague from Burkina Faso. We have to make AGOA also work for the people of the Sahel region. I think commodities like petrol, oil, is not the only thing. We have to focus on agriculture as a basis, because that's what we have. And so how do we make Agua work? I think there is a huge capacity building. My sister, sister Etim, she talked about women. Whenever there is war and conflict, women end up having to take care of the whole family, the whole community. How are we going to use, for example, uh, the women entrepreneurship program to capacitate women, but yet to really infuse money so that the micro credit women can have it and, 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 and take care of the livelihood of the families. I think these are the critical issues. We, we were talking with uh, uh, the National Guard in, uh, in Indianapolis, and they are talking about the, the fact that the military can work hand in hand with the civilian to really empower the community. I think we need to dig into that. But what is really kind of uh, in the air is what is the synergetic strategy which encompasses 
security, development, and uh, good governance. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador, for bringing, for bringing us this, uh, this good overall context. We're, we're going to take the last so I wonder if you could speak to that a bit as either as an example to other countries on ways to expand those economic, that economic base for small solar farmers, especially in areas that, that include any of those raw materials. Thank you. Uh, before, excuse me, uh, before we go to the next uh, question or comment, I wanted to um, interrupt our program for a brief minute. I mentioned earlier about the co-chair of the task force Representative BC from Texas, and he has joined us. I wanted to give him an opportunity to share a few words with you. Karen, thank you very much. It is uh, good to be with you this morning. Uh, I am serving the Armed Services Committee, and my interest in uh, what's going on right now in the continent of Africa is primarily from a military standpoint. I was just with the military in August, uh, and we visited with the President of Somalia. We were in Mogadishu. Uh, also in Djibouti, this is with the president of Djibouti, uh, and also uh, in Kenya. And I've been actually raising some concerns that I had about some of the activities that were going on in Africa. Uh, in, in, in particular, my one area of concern that I had, and I'll share with Karen, uh, was where these militant fighters were going to be leaving as they left places in the Middle East, uh, and concern uh, that they would seek places within Africa just because you have so many uncovered territories. Uh, there have been uh, uh, disputes about areas that particularly border areas in certain African countries that are, seem to be particularly uncovered. Uh, and so I thought it was the, uh, unfortunately the perfect recipe for something bad to happen. And we saw what happened in Niger. Uh, and so we'll continue to, to work on that aspect. I'm glad that so many people uh, here today uh, are concerned about what is going on uh, on the continent and we need to continue to talk about it because uh, there's obviously a, um, a, a big upside for so many great things that can be happening in, in the variety of different countries that are on the continent. Uh, the one thing, my, my biggest concern as a member of the Armed Services Committee, and usually on armed services, particularly with cutting on spending and things like that that we talk about, uh, but really honestly, my biggest concern right now is what the proposals and some of the actions that are taking place at the State Department, uh, because it was clear to me from my visit that uh, unless there can be uh, uh, more uh, emphasis put on governance and, and helping these countries to be able to self-govern, uh, helping them with their local security, or local law enforcement, local security forces, to where people can uh, have confidence in what the government is doing, I think the things are going to continue to get worse, and we certainly don't to see that happen. So uh, with that, thank you very much just for being here today. And Karen, you've got a great pulling everybody together and just wonderful to see such a large crowd. Thank you very much, uh, Representative. Let, let me just share with you that a couple of people have raised the question of Africa. And uh, I mentioned at the beginning that we're working on now pulling together a uh, delegation, a congressional delegation that will go over because many of us have concerns about uh, the U.S. Uh, military involvement uh, on the continent, in particular AFRICOM, and especially given an administration where we don't know where they're going, but uh, they, there certainly is an overemphasis, I think, from most of our opinion uh, on security. Obviously, that's a problem, but you need the State Department, you need it all. You can't just have one side. And so um, I'm very thankful that, that you came and know that there's a high interest here on these issues. Thank you very much, both, both of you, because without the congressional support that you provide and the visibility and the gravitas that you bring to this, we could not um, advance Africa policy at all in the US. So we're, we truly are very, very grateful to you. We're gonna take, um, we're gonna take just two more okay, because we need to have time to finish up. Who is going? Okay, all right, thank you. My name is Victor Adukonu, I am the president of the Togolese diaspora in the United States. Thank you for having this uh, event. My question is this, uh, the G5 uh, strategy does not involve Libya that is a safe haven for terrorists in Zion. 
how can we have uh, a sustainable uh, peace solution in Sahel without a legal and uh, uh, Libya government they have a full control of their territory? If we try to push uh, ter uh, terrorists from this Sahel, they still have area to go and get uh, uh, to, 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 to stay. So how can we have that Sahel uh, peace without having uh, um, to control uh, Libya. That's nice. Okay. Thank you. Good morning. What should be the role of the African Union in the region? And should the U.S. coordinate with the African Union? And someone mentioned that five nations in the region are French-speaking nations. What should be the role of the French? and coordinating any efforts in this region. And my last question is to Ms. Eaton. You have a defense experience in the Department of Defense. What is the role of uh, the U.S. in Niger? I mean, why, why, would, why should they be there? And to have five men killed, what were they doing? And lastly, I just want to say thank you to Congresswoman Karen Bass. I mean, she's the greatest person. <laughs> thank you. I think that Congresswoman Bass has some other um, colleagues that she wants to introduce. Yes, uh, let me just take a moment and introduce two uh, colleagues. I'd like to introduce Representative Marsha Fudge from the great state of Ohio, former chair of the Congressional Black Caucus. And I also, want to rep I also want to introduce our assistant leader, the highest ranking African American in the House of Representatives in Congress, for that matter, and that's Representative Jim Clyburn from the great state of South Carolina. But you guys are welcome to say a word. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. I think she's the greatest, too. <laughs> but thank you very much for coming, because that indicates the degree of support that you have within the Congress. And again, that just makes it so important for us. We, we really cannot thank you um, enough. So we have um, exactly seven minutes left, and we have these, um, these two um, questions about um, Libya, the African Union, and its role, and what's happening in Niger. Now, I don't know if any um, of the panelists want to um, comment on those questions. Uh, yes, so um, quickly. Um, so, Victor, uh, the president of the did say that the G5 did not involve Libya. Well, the G5 does not involve Senegal, and it doesn't involve, involve Nigeria either. Um, and I don't think that it's a technical mistake. Um, I think that we have to look at the G5 Sahel as not only a, being a military force, but it's a union of countries that share the same colonial history, that share the same languages, the same ethnic groups, the same state structures, and the same issues regarding tourism and ungoverned uh, spaces. So I think it was a strategic decision that was made for them to come together and be more effective if they did work together. When you look at Nigeria, which is a, a beast of its own, uh, it's the main financial driver of, of the ECOWAS, um, and uh, I mean, it's, it's a very different country. Uh, when you look at, at the French-speaking uh, African countries, Nigeria does not fit within that, that group of, of Niger, Kenya, Senegal, Mali, um, etc. So that's uh, my uh, answer to that. Now the role of the French. Um, one thing that I, sh I should ha add about the G5 Sahel being this union of countries uh, that share the same colonial history, they also share the same demons. And the French is definitely one of them, I have to say it. Uh, uh, I have all the French passports, so you know, I'm saying this with all caution, but uh, <laughs> the French have been extremely involved in the Sahel. Uh, 
for years and decades and centuries, I should say. Um, the French have saved Mali, so they have done good things in the Sahel, and their military assistance in the Sahel has been critical. Um, now they are coming under uh, harsh criticisms about uh, the way they're conducting operations. Uh, for example, in northern Mali, uh, the Kidal region uh, is not accessible to the Malian government, but it is accessible to the French. And this does uh, affect the peace process. So there are many questions about what are the French doing in the Sahel. They have the money, they have the, the, the history, they have the knowledge uh, to be there, but they are keeping secrets, and they should not be. Um, so, quick dirty answer. Thank you, thank you. All right, so now I'm going to give the floor to um, Linda, and then we're going to conclude with um, the ambassador because we're almost out of uh, time, and the discussion has been rich, but we have to make sure that we can um, I just wanted to pick up a thread um, that we've been sort of uh, weaving throughout this entire discussion, which is the uh, Madam Ambassador uh, pointed out. Uh, this is a security, such a huge uh, social uh, set of issues, and to have a strategy um, from the U.S. or any other uh, government that's focused on the Sahel that does not include robust elements of each of those pillars uh, is is problematic. And we do know that the, the, there is uh, an unbalance right now um, for the increasing emphasis on the security side. It's not saying that in, the interest in supporting uh, the G5 on the military side is, 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 is a bad thing. In fact, I think the ambassador uh, actually said that it was a good thing and that more support was needed. The issue is that we're not keeping peace in the other sectors. Um, and you know, if you're if you're not also looking at livelihoods, you're not also addressing sort of the future conflicts and, and issues of social cohesion and the fact that young people need jobs and that women need to be included and that security needs to be addressed. Um, then we're falling uh, behind. There have been different initiatives uh, throughout the years the U.S. government has put together uh, in, a, in an attempt to try to make sure that the State Department, USAID and the Department of Defense work together more cohesively, whether it's the Trans-Saharan Counterterrorism Partnership, whether it's SGI, um, or whether it's the Sahel Development Initiative as well. Everybody knows that the answer for U.S. government strategy to be effective is programs and projects that focus on all three of these aspects. Um, the problem has been consistent funding across the board for all of them. Uh, and we see right now um, that there tends to be an emphasis in times of crisis uh, for the security side. Uh, so it's something that I think a lot of thinking has already gone into. A lot of consultation with governments and the Sahel has gone into. Um, but the question is right now, how do we make sure that we have sufficient resources and coordination uh, to move forward with a lot of this good thinking that's already taking place? Thank you. And Mr. Ambassador. Because you represent the, the concrete example of a country that's on the give you the last word. Thank you for this honor. And I will just say that uh, to get rid of the terrorist threats, we need sustainable solutions. Uh, security area, economic level, and governance. But, uh, according to our economic real situation, it will be very heavy for us to tackle these issues ourselves. So we need to support the international community in order to face this risk. And uh, I think that the United States is uh, the biggest country in the world. And uh, I mean, uh, the United States is a, a big model for everyone. So we feel that no, I just want to the US can do something to help this community. If not, if some, nothing is done, there will be a risk that terrorists will get more strength in the region and they will spread the bad activity, dangerous activity around the world. Thank you, Mr. <coughs> Ambassador, for that, that plea. So our takeaways from this are that we have reinforced the nexus 
um, among security, governance, and development. That military relations, particularly with civil society, have to be nurtured and increased because ultimately civil society and citizens um, are the ultimate decision makers. The need for education, both formal and informal, and both in terms of security and governance, and certainly for um, sustainable development. The, the pivotal nature of civil society, especially youth and women, who sometimes um, seem to be um, overlooked, that civil society has to feel that it has a stake in its government in terms of both security and development. Mr. Ambassador, you talked about um, the need for diversified economies and an emphasis on small. Everyone has talked about the importance of decentralization. Concluded with the ambassador's plea that the United States needs to stay involved and up its um, involvement, both in terms of um, intellectual capital and in terms of um, dollars, that this is not the time to shrink. So I think that we need to um, thank the panelists for this rich discussion, thank um, Congress Member Bass and her colleagues and co-chair for really demonstrating to us that you care about Africa, that we as a country care um, about um, Africa. So please give all of these good folks a round of applause. panel. We had a wonderful conversation today and all of the people that participated in the Q&A. So um, if you would please drop off your evaluation forms and then also we need your um, the ID tags with the uh, chains. If you could just drop those off uh, on your way out. Thank you very much. We'll see you in 2018 and um, be ready for some fruitful discussions and see if there's some action out of us regarding the Libya situation next week.